Ladies and gentlemen, will you please take your seats? Dear winners, teachers, winners' families, special guests and colleagues, welcome. Bienvenue. Willkommen. Dobrodošli. Welcome. We are your hosts for the 12th Juvenis Translatoris Award Ceremony. We would like to begin the ceremony by asking you to grab the headphones on your desk, like so. And to the left and right, you can see the channels with the, the languages. And uh, look under your desk to find a box where you can select your language. And there's a pair of buttons to do that, and there's another pair to adjust the volume. Uh, you'll find all the official EU languages except Irish. From the translation side of the European Commission, we would like to thank our colleagues, the interpreters, for offering such a wide choice for this celebration of multilingualism. Now, let me introduce my dear co-host, Miha Zlicar from Ljubljana in Slovenia. It was Miha's dream to become an English teacher, but uh, somehow we ended up in the English translation department of the European Commission, which is a good thing because he has a passion for languages and technology, preferably combined. Thank you. And this is Anna Holmien from Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, she also aspired to become a language teacher, but was quite happy to work as a translator at the Commission for 11 years. From there, she moved on to the communication department and used to organize even as translatoris behind the scenes until she finally made it onto the stage. Oh, and we shouldn't forget to welcome also those who are following the ceremony on web streaming. Welcome, Good Europe. Europe. <laughs> so this ceremony takes place in the Charlemagne building in Brussels, right next to the main building of the European Commission, the Berlimont. And the ceremony and the translation contest itself have been organized by the Directorate General for translation since 2007. And when you entered the room, you saw some lovely photos from the schools uh, when they were taking part in, in the contest back in November. Well, over 3,000 students translated a text at the same time from one of the 24 official languages, EU languages, into another. Which makes for 552 possible combinations. This year, we've had 154, which is pretty impressive. Yeah. Portuguese into Dutch. Spanish into Bulgarian. Czech into Italian. We could go on, you know, uh, but we haven't got the older, um, all day. So on to the next point. We have asked our winners to send us some footage from their home countries and got some great material back, which we would like to share with you. Enjoy the snapshots from across Europe. Hello, my name is Astrid and I'm the Danish winner of the translating contest. Hey guys, I'm Deborah. I'm Katalin from Finland. Hi guys, I'm Lola. My name is Kate Porker and I'm here in Dublin and Ireland. I'm Julia, I'm from Italy. Hi everyone, I'm currently in Lublin. I live in a small village called Nazare, which has a wonderful beach as you can see. <laughs> Greetings from Split, the second largest city in Croatia. The city clock has been ticking for centuries on Piazza, unique by its 24 instead of 12 digits. This street is called Pusteme da Progen, which literally translated means let me pass. I'm on the sea right now. People usually come here to skate, like us, or uh, fish. There are some people fishing and I can show you the hole they make to fish. It's like a little hole. Trieste is a city 
on the Adriatic Sea and it's cool because we have both we have the sea and we have the mountains in winter you have to be aware because it's a bit dangerous because in Trieste here we have a strong powerful wind called Bora these trees right here turn the most beautiful pink in the late spring so it's a very lovely place actually my school is back there somewhere this is my favorite place here in Budapest it really never gets boring the best time is in summer when they build the cars from the bridge and people just come out here and sit on the bridge and have a picnic and have a good time right now I'm standing in front of the Danish Queen's Palace which is right here in Flensburg um, which is my hometown well, I think that this place is very cool and very unique because um, the royal family plays a very important role in Danish history and the Danish uh, monarch he is actually the oldest one in the entire world. Today I want to show you what carnival in Germany looks like. Now for me personally, going to the parade is some sort of a tradition because I've been there almost every year ever since I can remember. As you might have heard, Cologne is often considered the center of carnival in Germany and we're quite a bit away from that here in the southwest of Germany. But nevertheless, we also know how to celebrate and our carnival guilds always put in a lot of effort. This is Marley Park, which is a really big park close to where I live. There's loads to do and I really love spending time here. Um, I look forward to meeting all of you and I'll see you soon. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Astrid, Deborah, Katalin, Laura, Kate, Julia, Nika, Anna, and Dea. That made me feel homesick and eager to go on holiday in equal measure. And it's uh, also rather captured the essence of what we celebrated last year, the European Year of Cultural Heritage. It's Europe with all its history, culture, diversity, and youth. I would like now to give the floor to our Director General. Ladies and gentlemen, please give, give a warm welcome to Mr. Ritis Martikonis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna and Mika. The DG translation has uh, an understanding, an idea that spring comes to Brussels when the city welcomes this competition, which is called Juvenes Translatores. And I must confess that there is nothing more pleasing to my eye in this important, one of the most important rooms of the European Commission than seeing such a big crowd of people gathered here. I would like to begin by saying that uh, there is nothing more pleasant than on the occasion of this competition to address you in my mother tongue. Today we will hear a lot of beautiful things about languages, about the linguistic diversity, and about what is happening when we convey the message from one language to the other. But at the beginning, I would like to say that there is no language which is more important than your mother tongue. And uh, you, who were participating in this competition, demonstrated it very well. And the fact that here in Brussels, in one of the most important institutions of the European Union, we are able to talk to each other in our mother tongues. This is a very important, even fundamental principle of the organization of the European Union. It does not only show our attitude towards national identity, not only our attitude towards culture and its specificities, but also it shows how the member states organize themselves, how they bring their interests together. And this is a very important achievement of the EU. Now, in this competition, we had 3,252 participants. And uh, 
I think we have 3,252 winners because everyone who decided to take part in the competition is already a winner. So we have over 3,000 participants, but this time 28 of you have been considered the best. And uh, this is a very important achievement of yours. It is an important achievement because you were curious, you were inquisitive, you wanted to take one step more in challenging yourselves. And I would like to congratulate you with that. You took this step in the right direction. And now you come from the furthest corners of the European Union. We have winners from Portugal, we have winners from Finland, and the distance between the two is more than 5,000 kilometers. So it's 5,000 kilometers uh, is reduced to this one spot here in Brussels. And as I look at you, I have no doubt that you are all very different. You have very different interests. But once again, I can only rejoice about the fact that you are you share curiosity, creativity, a willingness to challenge yourselves. And I think that this is the characteristics that are most needed for Europe now. And Europe has always been special because of these characteristics. The success of Europe lies in its diversity, and you are a perfect example of this diversity. You are going to visit the Museum of Europe. This is one part of the program. You will visit that museum in the European Parliament. And I think that this is a very important possibility to take a look at history, but not get stuck in there. History never stops. And when you visit the museum, I think we all have to think about the present and also about the future, about what you are creating, about what you want Europe to be like. Without you and without us, Europe does not exist. The European institutions cannot function on their own. They cannot provide everything that your ideas and your contribution brings. Therefore, when you visit this Museum of History, you will see how varied our history was. And when you go there, think about what the future should be and what future you create. Therefore, I'm always very happy to hear in this competition what you have to say, what you bring along to this room in the European Commission. One thing will be very special this spring, and most of you are born more or less around 2001. So you are the best of the millennials. And this year you will have a possibility to participate in the elections to the European Parliament. This is a very important opportunity. This is another chance when your participation, rather than staying on the outskirts, will bring results. You can not only say what you want, but also give your contribution to that. So go and talk to your friends, go and talk to your family about this and take part in the elections, because participation in the European politics is a very important possibility for you. And uh, almost every Thursday, we see your peers who march here. They want to express their views towards climate and towards the future that they want to have. This is also an example of being active. Your participation and presence in here is not only important to you, but also to a big group of linguists that work at the European institutions. And I am very happy 
to say that here we have colleagues not only from DG translation, these are colleagues that work into and from all the languages. These were the colleagues that corrected your translations and they will want to congratulate you today. But we also have other colleagues from the European Parliament, from the Council. And so I would like to say my thanks again for the fact that we can communicate and cooperate so nicely because interpreters can help us. And my colleague, the Florica Finher, in the director of the DG Interpreting. She's also here. And uh, the now you are on the second floor. And on the first floor in this building, we have another conference taking place. It's a conference of universities where our colleagues, interpreters, will also be discussing about our profession and uh, future challenges and its main topics for today. So whatever you choose in the future, Whatever you universities and professions you dream about, I am 100% sure that your interest in languages and in culture will help you and also your ambitions and readiness to take the step forward and to experience something that you've never experienced. This makes you to be the people who are also inspiring us and you encourage us in these institutions to work and to think that our work is actually needed. Finally, I would like to sincerely congratulate not only you, but also your mothers, your fathers, your siblings, your teachers. Every time when I meet you, I don't know which one is happier, the teachers, the mothers or fathers or the students themselves. But I see very many enthusiastic people gathered here today, and these are people who can be proud of you. They can be proud of you who have achieved something very important. You took a step in the direction of experiencing something new. So I would like to congratulate you all, make friends, get to know each other, and Europe will be a better place for all of us to live in. Congratulations, congratulations, and I will be looking forward to hearing your thoughts and ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matikonis. Your speech made me think of a slogan we often use in uh, the Directorate General for Translation. Languages take you further. To Brussels and beyond, eh? Mm -hmm. We have a tradition to invite some of our winners to give a speech at the ceremony. The first one today is by Ana Silva from Portugal. And as befits the occasion, she will be addressing us all in her native Portuguese. A big hand for Ana. Good morning, everyone. First and foremost, I'd like to express my heartfelt congratulations and thanks to my family and teacher who made such a big contribution so I could share this experience today with so many extremely talented young people whom I would also like to congratulate. I'd also like to congratulate everyone involved in this major event in whatever form, because this is something which will undoubtedly mark our lives. Now, I've been fascinated by languages since I was a child, but it was only this year that I was able to accept this challenge of translating into my own language. And I appreciated just how gratifying such an experience could be. As a European citizen about to come of age and therefore able to participate actively in the world of politics, I am bound to be concerned about what Europe will become. In an ideal world, I imagine a Europe where political corruption is not a reality, where poverty is just a word which we can look up in the dictionary. 
I imagine myself being able to go onto the labour market where my skills will be appreciated and inequality, discrimination between genders does not take place. My aspiration is for a tolerant society which totally rejects racism and xenophobia and accepts every individual irrespective of their differences. So we as young Europeans must make ourselves heard and show our ability to innovate and have a positive influence on today's and future societies. I believe the European Union has a very important role in promoting the right of every individual to speak and write in their own language. As we know from the so well-known quotation by Umberto Eco, translation is the language of Europe. It's true, translation and interpretation are so important insofar as they maintain linguistic diversity and the particular specificities of a region or a country. Furthermore, by learning new languages, citizens can communicate directly with one another in a European Union, which is broader and more diverse with every day that passes, hence its slogan, United in Diversity. But let us, above all, try and achieve what we represent. I'm lucky to be able to do a sport I like, artistic gymnastics, and it's possible for me to do that, but also take part in projects such as Erasmus+, Plus, which promote my passion for languages. The only way in which we can feel that we have achieved our potential is by doing what we love to do. And that is the message which I would like to convey to you here today. Thank you all very much for listening so closely to me. Thank you very much, Anna for your valuable points of view. Indeed, let's all make ourselves heard this May in the European election. I would now like to welcome our second Juvenes Oratores speaker on stage, Krzysztof Wazocha from Poland. I'm honored by the fact of being able to represent my country in this gala. I think that for us all, uh, the winners of this competition, this is a momentous uh, time uh, that we are experiencing at the, the brink of our adulthood. We come from all EU countries. Our cultures differ, we speak different languages, and the interests of our family countries may be divergent in some matters. But we're gathering here, amongst other things, in order to show that the young generation of Europeans wants to take an active part in building the European civilization. It is worth uh, em emphasizing what connects us, that is, the heritage of ancient cultures of ancient Greece and Rome, as well as almost 20 centuries of Christianity, the three foundations um, for the European culture. Ever since the Middle Ages, uh, attempts were made for Europe to integrate the vision of the young Emperor Otto III is admirable, who under his rule wanted to unite the lands of our common continent, recognizing at the same time the cultural autonomy and the right to autonomy of each of these. Subsequent actions eventually led to the establishment of the EU as we know it, a union of 28 democratic states. Today, at the time of United Europe, we face many challenges that we should um, face as a community. Above all, uh, one of the major problems that some of the, con some of the people, in including my um, um, people from my country have, is the difficult access to culture and education, and language is the vehicle for culture. How we and our peers may actually contribute to the building of the Europe of future. First of all, we should take care of our own education and try and become informed participants of the political, cultural, and social uh, life. Uh, schools have a huge role to play here. Um, uh, learning foreign languages should have an important role to play, especially English, which is the lingua franca for the world today. This covers also other modern languages which are spoken across the EU. 
Learning these languages should not be in isolation from minimum general knowledge about the culture, customs, and the history of other countries, thanks to which you may not only understand the language of someone from another country, but also their culture. And last but not least, every EU citizen should take active part in building a civic society where they live. As a result of um, increasing migrations and severing generational links, people feel less and less attached to their little homelands, which is not a positive given the objective of uh, creating an informed civic society. State authorities and people, when taking their own actions, should try and build local bonds based on mutual respect and uh, based on caring for the common good. I hope that we are all aware of the importance of the mission of building an informed and responsible uh, society which would also respect the autonomy and rights of each of the countries. An event like this should be a celebration of our European qualities uh, which result from common heritage as well as common future goals. Thank you. Thank you. Christoph, for your take on the current and upcoming challenges for the EU. Again, the best way to address these is. Oh my God. Job. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> Bonjour. Good morning. I'm Captain Europe, and this time I'm going to be voting. In order to save Europe, one superhero is not enough. You can all be heroes and heroines by voting. For many of you, the European elections, which will take place from the 23rd to the 26th of May this year, will be an opportunity to vote in the European elections for the first time. Who are you going to vote for? I can't tell you. But I'd just like to invite you to think about your hopes, your values, your aspirations for the future and the kind of Europe you want to see. Have a think, get informed and tell your friends all about it. And vote. Stavolta voto. This time I'll vote. In these elections I'll vote. So let's together save our future. Captain Europe, <laughs> right there. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Whether you were born in a democracy or not, we must all be aware that democracy can't survive on its own, but each generation must stand on the barricades to defend it. I hope you've all had the chance to look at the European Parliament stand just outside the room before the ceremony. Anna. Are you going to vote? Oh, you bet. I'm going right there up on the barricades and slip my ballot in the box. Yes. <laughs> I'd rather take responsibility for the future than blame others for the present. But we have one uh, young speaker still, and this is someone who competes not only in translation, but also in public speaking. So you're in for a cheat. I give you the winner from Denmark, Astrid Slot Larsen. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity of saying a few words today. It's a real honour for me to speak to so many talented winners from without Europe. I'd like to begin with something I know we all share, our passion for learning languages. Learning a new language is not simple, and that's why it's so part important that today we are gathered here as people able to communicate in foreign languages. I think we can all be unbelievably proud of our perform performances because we've taken a lot of time doing something which is certainly not a stroll in the park. It's a challenge that you have to be prepared to take up and commit to. But as the saying goes, practice makes perfect. Now, I was lucky enough to experience myself what this involves. 
This involved an exchange with the United States where I met many Americans of my age. And it was great to see how I grew with this challenge, using language as a key for getting to know American culture. At the end of the day, language gives you the key to a country's culture. If you understand the language, it's easier to understand culture, people, and the way in which language is an essential part of their daily lives. And of course, what's so fascinating is that there are so many things that you can't just translate. And we all understood that from Juvenes Translatoris. A good translation means that you have to be able to translate culture and humour into the foreign language. And I think we've all learned a great deal of that from this contest. I undoubtedly have. Something else we all share is our nationality. We are all Europeans, even though we all come from different countries. And being European, again, is something I think we can be so proud of. For me, being a European means I can freely decide if I study in Denmark or another EU country. I feel I'm part of a community that contributes to greater understanding of our nations. For me, being European means that I'm free to say what I have on my mind and I live in a society where there is space for us all. For me, it's a community where being different is not a disadvantage and where international relations are part of our daily life. Europe is a community where we pull together in difficult situations and help one another out where we need to. We Europeans are curious about the world around us and we're very good at meeting one another in a spirit of open sincerity. But if we are to cooperate effectively, we need to communicate properly. And language is the key word for us. If we can talk to one another about things and take advantage of our understanding of their cultures, it's far easier for us to avoid conflict and forge compromise. Now, as I said at the outset, I think it's so important for young people to learn languages. In fact, I would be so bold to say it's one of the most important things we do. If we can communicate with people from different backgrounds, we can get so far. If we can convey messages properly and recognise we all see things from different vantage points, we can avoid so many conflicts between our nations. So I think we should be mega proud of one another for the way in which this has contributed to the further development of foreign languages. And we shall continue to do that. I believe in dialogue, in cooperation, and above all, I believe in Europe. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Astrid. Now, Mika, I particularly appreciated how uh, all three speakers focused on European values and the importance of languages in that aspect ahead of the European elections. But not many people know that the EU values are in fact listed in the Treaty on European Union, Article 2, <laughs> which is binding on all EU countries. True, we should remind about that more often. So what are the values, Mika? Our union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity. Freedom. Democracy. Equality. The rule of law. And respect for human rights. Including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. Thank you, Mika. If I'd learned one thing by heart from the treaty, it would be that part. So, we have another speech coming up, this time from a, a representative of one of the most important uh, professions there are, teachers. Let me welcome Bernice Fenn Kieran on stage. Yes. Good morning. It really is a pleasure to be here again. Uh, last year when I entered this wonderful Sala Gasperi with our winner from Spain, it was quite an experience. Uh, little did I think I would be back and certainly not seeing it from this very different perspective. 
Uh, when I was asked to give my vision of language teaching in the future and the role of teachers in it, whew, I took a deep breath and uh, I began to unravel my thoughts. The future of language teaching depends on the need for language learning, obviously, which depends on language diversity, which depends on language preservation, which is not something to be taken for granted considering that we are losing languages at an alarming rate all over the world. Respect for language diversity has been a priority and I believe a key strategy for the European Union. The need for language competence, not only in one but in several foreign languages, has grown. Whether it's politics, international law, arts, research, uh, e economics, uh, we, our scale is worldwide and of course we do need language professionals, teachers, translators, interpreters. Language arose out of necessity. It spread, blended, evolved due to circumstance, mass migration, trade, expansion. It was meticulously preserved by early scribes in written texts as a cultural legacy. But deliberate, conscious learning of a foreign language is a relatively recent phenomenon. First, as a means of intellectual advancement for the elite, and only recently available to all. The means of language acquisition have also changed. Now we can communicate with anyone all over the world at the touch of a key with the internet. We have multiple learner-centered personalized options with computer-assisted language programs. Apps for specific language areas, suitable especially for adult professionals with a specific purpose. They are not, however, devoid of a certain element of danger. If specialised courses are not preceded by basic communication skills, we may well end up piecing together a jigsaw of jargon rather than producing meaningful language. Sometimes we're overwhelmed, intimidated by technology. And we have to remember it's a tool, an aid which we can choose to use if it suits our purpose. A means, not an end in itself. And of course, we also have language immersion. Whether by choice or forced by circumstances, we're on the move. Many people live and work abroad. We should not only assist migrants in learning the language of their new home, but also embrace the opportunity to learn from the language and the culture of their countries of origin, rather than perceive it as a threat. And we also have access to language input through the media, original language versions of TV programs and cinema, though some countries have suffered and still suffered the disastrous effects of dubbing on linguistic competence. So, where does all this leave the teacher? The respected tutor, source of knowledge and guidance of old. Well, there are now other sources of knowledge. But have we become obsolete? Are we in danger of extinction? I don't think so. For a start, we're here today at the European Commission, so that's encouraging. We have had to, and we continue to adapt. In the future, some of us will be designing and monitoring those online language learning platforms. Many others will be in schools, just like now, teaching language classes, taking advantage of modern tools, but laying the foundations for meaningful communication and literacy, which children, especially at an early age, need. It's crucial to reinforce early linguistic competence. Language is meaning. Language is communication. The wealth of possibilities of language evocation, connotation, nuance, uh, etymological significance, tone, cadence, 
Mastering all of this requires early face-to-face -face human intervention so that at a later stage, people will be prepared to use all the other learning tools with discernment. We will be a linguistic hub, filtering, coordinating and connecting. The teachers of the future will need to be well-trained professionals and both culturally and linguistically versatile, capable of taking the tedium out of the slow process of language learning in a fast-moving world, able to encourage and to inspire. The challenges, excessively large groups which hinder student-centred learning, holding on to our slot amid so many new and attractive subjects, sufficient financing to equip schools to meet the times, managing cultural diversity and multilingual classrooms, assessing students in a meaningful way, continuous professional development opportunities, and then recognition, recognition of the importance of the teacher's role. The future sounds daunting, but it started a long time ago. There have been tremendous social and technological changes over a relatively short period of time. Perhaps soon the pace will slow down, the dust will settle, and we'll take stock of where we are and where we're heading. The future isn't something that's given or imposed on us. It's something which we shape, so we must do that responsibly. The future is what we want it to be. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Denise. We're so thankful to all the teachers for the huge effort you've invested in the future of Europe. I think it's time to mention students who are not with us here today, but who have received special mentions for their translations. 240 students in all, or 7% of all the participants, wrote translations that were very close to the winning ones. Sometimes, only a single choice of a word made the difference. And luckily, we could uh, organize a few uh, ceremonies for them as well. For example, the nine Polish students who received special mentions were actually invited to the European Commission representation in Warsaw for a translation workshop. And I have to mention the Estonian student who received a special mention for his translation from French. He has studied French for two years and on his own with online apps. He was Sorry, come again? Yes. <laughs> Beats you, doesn't it? He was also invited to the commission representation in Tallinn. And similar events are organized in Slovakia, the United Kingdom, and Hungary. Congratulations to all students with special mentions and uh, keep those special mentions in your CVs for the future. So. <laughs> I never tried an online app to, to learn a language, did you? No, I wouldn't dare. No. <laughs> no, I, I would think no. But hang on a minute. You have been a translator for quite some time. I mean, you worked as a translator for quite some time. You no longer are. What makes a good translation? What makes a good translation? Well, we always underline the importance of the mother tongue. So I want you all to forget the fact that Micha from Slovenia is working in the English department. That's a special case. But you need to have a good uh, mastering of your mother tongue. And you need to find the combination between being true to the original and uh, creating a fluent text in the target language, as it, we say. It sounds a daunting task. I hope machines can help. They can help, certainly. But I think that we will have to uh, uh, help them on the way as well. Us helping so machines. Sounds yes. like fun. Yes. Anyway, uh, 
Um, uh, we're happy that our um, European Commissioner, Gunther Oettinger, has managed to find time in his packed agenda to be here today with us. Uh, Commissioner Oettinger is not only the Commissioner in charge of translation and interpretation, but also budget and human resources, among several other responsibilities. Willkommen, Herr Kommissar Oettinger. Lieber Herr Generaldirektor, Director General, dear young translators, ladies and gentlemen from all 28 member states who have taken part in the 12th edition of our competition, I'm very happy to see you all here, that your teachers are with you, or your parents, or your friends that from the member states we have representatives of ministers, ministries of education or representatives of embassies here in Brussels. So I would basically welcome all of you who appreciate the importance of quality translation and interpretation as we understand it here. In the Tower of Babel, things went wrong. There was linguistic diversity, people from all over the world, but no communication. Now, the European Commission has 24 language combinations and innumerable dialects. Because the diversity of Europe is part of Europe's cultural heritage. Now, you, of course, are the young generation in our European Union, 18 years old, perhaps able to vote in the European elections for the first time. So you are more and more decisive what the direction of travel will be for Europe. Now, if you look to the future, you have to know where you come from. If I think of what our founding fathers have done, if I think of our history in the past and everything that has led to today's Europe, that gives us foundations on which we can build. All too often, Europe has been a continent of wars, of enmity, of hostile neighbours. Now, I come from the southwest of Germany, we have France just across the border in Alsace-Lorraine, and yet over centuries I could tell you about all of the enmity and hostility between our two countries. But at long last, our grandmothers and grandfathers in 1945 said, enough is enough. After the last big world war that was started by Germany, was the responsibility of Germany, and was lost by Germany. So after so many years of war, we have had 70 years of peace, the longest period in which we have never known peace in the heart of Europe. And my generation is in many ways the most fortunate we've seen in Europe, born after the war, able to go to school, able to choose their professions, and we must do everything in our power to ensure that these 70 will be followed by another 70, another 100, indeed permanent peace, and must do this for you, because you have 70, 80, 90 years to look forward to. Now, Europe began with six countries. Now there are 28 of us. Perhaps soon one country fewer, because you never know what's coming out of London these days. But we do have a common cultural heritage. We have separate linguistic areas, but a common cultural area. We have very much in common in terms of our architecture. We have monuments which are similar throughout Europe. Arches, old cities, ports, castles and who knows what else. 
Of course, we have our musical cultural heritage, opera, operetta, our cultural heritage in literature from Shakespeare to Goethe. We have cultural heritage with our eating and drinking. Uh, of course, you have a different wine in Bordeaux from in the southwest of Germany, but Europe's wine-growing culture is thousands of years old, starting in Georgia and then spreading to the rest of the continent. So the topic was a fascinating one. We had this year of cultural heritage, and that was the topic for which you worked. Now, heritage requires commitment because your heritage is an asset, is a value, and these are assets and values that we must maintain. And this is enshrined in the Treaty of Lisbon. For example, parliamentary democracy, not dictatorship, not autocracy, the social market economy, not a planned economy and not capitalism, the state rule of law, independent courts, separation of powers, rule of law, as I say, all very important, freedom of expression, freedom of press, a freedom to think what you wish, freedom of religion, and no censorship, no controlled press, no state religion. Rather, what we have is freedom and freedom of movement. Now, these values have been important for us and I believe must be maintained. But we have to recognize that there are other orders and disorders in the world. Wars of religion, terrorism, Islamism, ISIS, dictatorship, displaced persons, rape, and other systems which give preference to autocrats in Ankara, in Moscow, and, and, and also in the White House. We see autocrats 24-7. And we see this in a country with over one billion inhabitants, China, a mixture of Confucius and Mao Zedong. And if we wish to promote and maintain our orders in this conflict between different orders and different values, if we can do this all together, if you all wish to maintain these values, then we and you must fight for these values as citizens, as voters, as people who can express an opinion and convince others. And you all have that talent. You are educated, you're intelligent, you're committed. In your work, you have demonstrated that you do more than just what is required by your duty. And I have to say, I envy you because you have great futures to look forward to. But it must be a European future. Returning to materialism, protectionism, populism would be totally wrong. Let's think of the world in 2050, your future. If we can shape, help shape the world on the basis of your thoughts and your values, not dominate that world, but shape that world so we don't end up as the filling between in a sandwich between the US and China. If we are to do that, we need Team Europe. We need the union that is Europe. We need you as our team, a multicultural team with many mother tongues, but with a common understanding of how the world should look tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, thanks to the contribution of Europe. Now, many challenges await us, but you have all skills and talents to achieve that. So I wish you all the very best for your professional and your personal futures. And my thought is establish, develop contacts with the other 
contesters from the 27 other member states. Keep in touch, visit one another, message one another. If we can create a network of 28 groups of people, that will be a network for Europe as a whole. And I think that is so important alongside your family networks and other networks, and this will help you move in a stable and successful way forward in the decades that lay before you. So on behalf of the European Commission, my congratulations to you all. Thank you for participating, and above all, congratulations on your performances, which I think will enable you to march into the future with greater self-confidence. I also would like to congratulate your teachers and parents. We in the Commission will continue this competition, because the fact that you've taken part so effectively is the biggest encouragement we can have. Thank you, Herr Oettingen, for the ermutigung. Well, Thank you for that encouragement for fighting for our common Europe. Time for the main item of today's award ceremony. The 2018 Juvenus Transitoris winners will receive their awards. May I ask Mr. Oettinger and Mr. Mike Cornus to join us on stage for this task? Official photos will be taken with the group photo at the end and we will share them with you afterwards. We will now call all the winners on stage one by one in protocol order. And protocol order <coughs> means the alphabetical order of the name of the country in the language of the country. You can learn more about our winners on social media, but Anna and I would like to share with you some snippets from their lives as we hold them on stage. The winner for Belgium, Anse Martisona, who translated from English into Latvian. The past, the past meets the present in Anse's uh, presentation, uh, which she did online, as she mentioned online apps as a great source for language learning, but also expresses her gratitude for having had the chance to learn Latin at school and learn to appreciate the ancient Roman culture. Absreitsu. Bulgaria, Joanna Gorgieva. Joanna, translated from German into Bulgarian, describes herself as a book lover. She says she hasn't stopped reading since she turned five. It's a good thing she took a break to win the competition. <laughs> She's passionate about the environment, but eager to make a career in languages or history in studying German, English, and would like to add Finnish, Spanish, and Danish to the mix. Cestito. <laughs> Czechia, Marketa Sachanova. You can go on, Hakim. Marketa, translated from English into Czech, speaks English and Spanish and has decided to give Juvenis Translatoris a go to see if she would be up to the challenge. Uh, but she also did it to get the epic blue t-shirt with all the words in different languages all over it. What else to say? Achievement unlocked. Gratului. And now the winner for Denmark, Astrid Slot Larsen, who translated from English into Danish. So in Astrid's school, she is in charge of giving guided tours to visiting foreign teachers. I think we got a taste of that in the video earlier. I also appreciated that Astrid underlined in her speech that learning languages is hard. And indeed, all the winners here today should be proud. Tillykke. For Germany, Deborah Dittele, who translated from English into German. Deborah also does Latin at school as Anse and is fascinated by ancient Rome. She believes that it is because of Latin that she takes great pleasure in messing about with languages, as she says, and figure out how to translate a text 
as close to the original sense and impact as possible. Herzlichen Glückwunsch. And for Estonia, Lisa Maria Komisarov, who translated from English into Estonian. Lisa Maria knows English, she knows Swedish really well, I can tell you. Russian, French, and you guessed it, Latin. And loves to see different patterns and pathways of foreign languages. On her wish list for the future, we find Hungarian, Japanese, and Hebrew. Palju Anna. And for Ireland, I call Kate Parker. And Kate, I have a question for you. Can we have a mic? You have a very personal connection to your school. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, yes, so in the early 70s, my grandfather, along with a group of local parents, decided to set up a Gael School, which is an Irish language primary school in Dublin. They wanted to create a space for the children of the area to learn to speak Irish and to give them the gift of language. I actually managed to attend that same school and that's where my interest in language was nurtured. Um, I'm very, very proud to be able to say that I can speak Irish and I would really like to think that through supporting and speaking Irish we'll be able to preserve the language so that generations of Irish people to come will be able to enjoy and reap the rewards of knowing their native tongue. Cohortus. For Greece, we have Elisabeth Zagaridibalska, who translated from Polish into Greek. <laughs> Elisabeth loves languages and takes great pride in representing her country. Her choice of languages, Greek and Polish, reflects her dual nationality. She also speaks English and French and looks forward to learning Spanish or Italian in due course. Language learning, she says, has opened up whole new horizons for her. Sigaritiria. <laughs> from Spain, we have Sara Picos Gomez, who translated from English into Spanish. Sara comes from Galicia, and in addition to Spanish, her mother tongue, she also speaks Galician, which makes it easy for her to understand Portuguese. She, of course, speaks English and French too, has a passion for astronomy and robotics, and is attracted to all things Scandinavian. Her future show sure looks bright and digital. Enhorabuena. From France, I would like to welcome Léa Marisal, who translated from Spanish into French. <laughs> Léa signed up for Juvenis Translatoris without having previously translated a word. She took the plunge and succeeded. She speaks French, Spanish and English, and also some sign language. She is convinced languages will continue to play an important role in her life. Félicitations. Next up, from Croatia, Dea Šimat, who translated from English into Croatian. <laughs> Dea, who comes from the ancient town of Trogir and wants to pursue a career in tourism, decided to take part in the competition out of curiosity. She speaks English and Italian equally well and at first wasn't quite sure which one to choose for the competition. It turns out that she's made the right decisions. From Italy, I'd like to welcome Giulia Rorato, who translated from Slovenian into Italian.
Julia comes from a town near Trieste, close to the Slovenian border, and her parents thought it would be a good idea if she learned the language of her neighbors. So she did. And whilst at it, she's picked up English, German, and Russian on the way. Growing up in a fantastic melting pot there is Trieste, she has come to appreciate firsthand the power of languages to connect people. Complimenti. Next up from Cyprus is Georgia Himaridi, who translated from English into Greek. <laughs> Georgia has been a family interpreter since she was a child, helping her younger sister get along in Greek in a household where English, Greek and Portuguese are spoken on a daily basis. Her favorite word is kath catharsis in Greek, which sort of means relief from strong emotions. Interesting that mine is kathreftis, which is similar, but it means a mirror, so... Sikharitiria. <laughs> and now we go north to Latvia. Elvis Groskops, who translated from English into Latvian. I would like to share with you one of Elvis' childhood memories. He vividly remembers lying on the bed reading a simple, simple English-Latvian dictionary with brightly colored pictures next to the words. He was captivated and has been learning English since then. Absvetsi. <laughs> For Lithuania, Thomas Lugauskas. Translated from English into Lithuanian. <laughs> Thomas always thought that he was better in sciences and IT than languages, so he was very surprised to win a translation contest. So if you are better in sciences and IT than in languages, you must be very good. Sveikino. <laughs> So, and for Luxembourg, we have Annika Elisabeth Küster. And, uh, yes. <laughs> so, Annika, I know that even for a brief visit to Luxembourg, you get a taste of its multilingual culture. What is it like to actually live there? Well, in Luxembourg, uh, the question that is usually asked on a daily basis is, what dress my heart? What language shall we speak today? <laughs> In a country where approximately 48% of the population consists of foreigners, well, you have to be able to switch between languages a lot. And well, it's very interesting to um, not only translate between what is said, but also between um, the cultures that are connected to languages and to read between the lines. Herzlichen Glückwunsch. <laughs> from Hungary, I'd like to invite on stage Laura Kantor, who translated from English into Hungarian. And I would like to invite Laura to share her thoughts with us on language learning. Yeah, I just want to say how grateful I am that I, I had an opportunity to learn languages. And uh, I just wanted to say that it's, it's very important that we learn languages and uh, because it connects with each other. And if we can under understand each other, the languages connect with each other and uh, not separate us. Thank you. Thank you. Laura loves her mother tongue, Hungarian, but admits we might not be too far off calling it difficult as it's sometimes too complex even for Hungarians themselves, <laughs> as she puts it. <laughs> Next up, are we? Gratulalo. <laughs> From Malta, 
we have Francesca Vassallo, who translated from Maltese into English. <laughs> Francesca comes from a bilingual country where Maltese are, and English are spoken, and she gave you Venice Translator as a go because she wanted to see what translating for the EU feels like. I've never done a UVNS competition, but I can tell you firsthand that translating at the Directorate General for Translation is the best translation job in the world, bar none. Auguri. For the Netherlands, Ceres Verkaik, who translated from English into Dutch. When Ceres is not in school following a bilingual English-Dutch education program, she has her own business and works as a freelance content creator. She writes articles, web texts or translations and hopes to study creative business next year. Gefeliciteerd! Now, for Austria. Valentin Fraas, who translated from English into German. <laughs> Valentin is a great fan of classical films and uh, directors like Pasolini, Bartolucci, Kubrick, Haneke and Tarkovsky, which is why he has started learning Italian. What he likes most about his native Austria is the strong cultural tradition of cabaret, satire and humor. Herzlichen Glückwunsch! Next up from Poland, Krzysztof Wajoha, who translated from Spanish into Polish. Krzysztof, whom his teacher describes as a boy of many talents, is doing his studies in Polish and Spanish, a bilingual program. He also speaks English, is learning Italian, believes that speaking several languages is not only useful for travel, but in your daily life as well. Gratulacje. Our next winner is from Portugal, Ana Silva, who translated from English into Portuguese. Anna comes from a surfing paradise in Portugal called Nazaré. She's an avid sports lover who loves learning languages and eating chocolate. I'd sign up for that any day. The win comes to her as a big surprise and she's really been looking forward to meeting people from across Europe here in Brussels. Parabéns. The winner from Romania is next, Maria Alexandra Gergiel, who translated from English into Romanian. <laughs> Maria Alexandra has always enjoyed learning new languages, speaks German in addition to English and her native Romanian, and she recently took up learning Japanese. She signed up to see whether translating was fun, and I think she got the answer. Felicitări! Next is the winner from Slovenia, Nika Kobetic, who translated from English into Slovenian and would like to share with us some of her views. So, um, like my previous speakers have mentioned, uh, Anna, Astrid and Krzysztof, uh, learning foreign languages in, is important because it helps you discover culture, um, and develop international mindedness, but it also helps you discover your own language as well. And what I find special about this particular competition is that you get to, um, is that not only does it promote learning foreign languages, but also being eloquent in your own language. So, um, like Nelson Mandela once said, um, when you speak to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. But when you speak to a man in his own language, that goes to his heart. Uh, Nika is a self-professed language and science lover with a plan to keep adding new languages to her already impressive portfolio of Slovenian, English, 
German, Norwegian, French, and Chinese, which she has chosen based on how they sound. Czystitke. <laughs> For Slovakia, Sofia Gregorova, who translated from German into Slovak. <laughs> Sofia thinks that German sounds really good and likes the way some words are pronounced. It's also a very logical language, so if you understand the rules, it's really a piece of cake. So there you go. Of her home country, she says that although Slovakia is a small country, people there have big hearts. Gratulujem. For Finland, Katalin Baran, who translated from Hungarian into Finnish. She looks quite different from when she was slipping on the ice in her hometown Turku in the video earlier. Katalin speaks Hungarian at home, but Finnish everywhere else. Paljon onnia. <laughs> and now we go to Sweden. King Fägersten, who translated from English into Swedish. King goes to the German school in Stockholm and has spoken German since he was two years old, which for me, who knows Sweden a little bit, seems to be a very good investment. Well played, King. <laughs> Gratis. <laughs> and now for the United Kingdom, Natalia Glasman, who translated from Spanish into English. <laughs> Natalia speaks Russian at home, but Spanish has a special place in her heart. She watches films and TV series from all of the Hispanic world's world and dreams about traveling across all of South America. Congratulations. It's almost time to close the ceremony and go for lunch just outside the room. Uh, but first, a big hand from all of us and a heartfelt thank you from Anna and myself to the interpreters. Incredible, isn't it? Thank you. And can we, ple can we please have all of the 28 winners on stage for some group photos? It's been a wonderful occasion to meet here today uh, in a truly multilingual fashion and we hope you can relax and enjoy yourselves now that the solemn part of the celebrations is over. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take the chance. Yes. I've forgotten about the music. We're not in there, right? No. <laughs>